Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, really welcome to this event. Uh, I'm Anupam Agarwal. I'm the interim dean for the Hear Singh School of Medicine. On behalf of our school, I want to welcome everyone and thank you for taking the time to celebrate the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King with us today. As a pivotal figure in the American Civil Rights Movement, Dr. King sought to end racial discrimination and segregation. His advocacy for nonviolent resistance, coupled with his powerful and eloquent speeches, helped to galvanize the movement and bring about significant change. As a Nobel Peace Prize winner, Dr. King's legacy continues to inspire people around the world who are working for social justice and equality. In March 1966, at a convention for the Medical Committee for Human Rights in Chicago, he declared, of all forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. These remarks struck a chord with me because they support the Hearsing School of Medicine's dedication to attaining health equity and to welcome all people. It also mirrors our outlook on racial injustice and our willingness to listen, learn, and act to end racism. Again, thank you all for attending our second annual Martin Luther King Jr. Commemoration event. Our Hearsing School of Medicine Office of Diversity and inclusion has a wonderful program ahead for you today. I'd like to introduce our first special guest. This group is one of the premier choirs in the Southeast and under the direction of Mrs. Valerie Harris. Welcome to the stage, Miles College Golden Voices. Check deep up into the bed of the stars and 
Come in, the doors are fastened and the windows clear. Keep your hand on your bow. Hold on, hold on. Nora said you got lost to track. You can't go straight. Keep a looking back. Your hand on your plow. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Keep your hand on your plow. Hold on, hold on. If you wanna get to heaven. 
Miss uh, Valerie Harris and the Miles College uh, Golden Voices of joining us here today. Another round of applause to them. This is the second year our Hearsay uh, Office for Diversity and Inclusion School of Medicine has hosted the Martin Luther King Jr. commemoration event and the first time that we have been able to do this in person. So we are so glad to have you here um, today. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I am sure many of you have uh, heard about the destructive tornadoes that hit Selma, Alabama yesterday evening, killing six people uh, and damaging home in Dallas County and uh, homes of Selma residents. Selma is a rural, town just south of us, played a significant role in the civil rights movement. The Selma marches were an organized protest for the blocking of Black and African Americans' rights to vote and systematic uh, racism in the South. In fact, the men who we commemorated today led the second of these three marches. I would like to take a moment of silent reflection to pray for those that lost their life and their homes destroyed. Dr. King once said, the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and think critically. Intelligence plus character, this is the goal of true education. And that is why we're here today. Together, we are working to be the dream. I am so delighted and honored to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Paulette Dilworth, who has served as the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at UAB since 2015. Before joining UAB, she was faculty and assistant vice president for access and community initiative at Auburn University as well as Associate Professor for, uh, of Curriculum Studies in the School of Education at Indiana University, Bloomington. Dr. Dilworth's impressive career includes over 30 years 
of experience and diversity, education, consulting and training, higher education, outreach, recruitment, retention, research, and teaching. Dr. Dilworth earned her PhD in educational studies from Emory University in Atlanta. While at Emory, she worked in the Office of Equal Opportunity Programs as the Director of Minority Affairs and the Assistant Director of Equal Opportunity Programs. She then moved to Indiana University in 2000, where she was appointed by the mayor of Bloomington to serve as uh, on the commission of the status of black males. She has devoted both her professional and personal life to exploring issues of access civic engagement, equity, and community building. Dr. Dilworth remains active in professional civic and higher education organizations. Throughout her career, she has been recognized with several awards for her contribution to research, teaching, and education, such as the National Council for Social Studies Exemplary Research Award and the Kirkland Teaching for Social Justice Award and the Emory University Outstanding Contributions and Service at the University Award. She has authored and co-authored numerous research publications and served as editor, consultant, and reviewer, and contributor for many more. Please welcome with me Dr. Paulette Delworth. Thank you so much, Mona, for that warm introduction. And uh, I have to uh, be totally transparent. M Mona is in part uh, guilty of me being here as she chair co-chaired my search committee back in 2015. So all of the blame should be placed on her. <laughs> But it's been a great experience and I really have uh, enjoyed my time here at UAB. And I wanna thank all of you for being here today, taking time out of your schedules uh, to join us uh, for this commemoration of the work of Dr. King and especially for the work that we do here at UAB every day. Um, I want to offer a very, very special thank you to Miles College and those young people. I see now why, why you are referred to as the Golden Voices. It's amazing, and thank you so much. Um, also, I, and again, being totally transparent this morning, Dr. Harris and I have a shared history, and part of that shared history has to do with someone who was very important in my life, uh, as far as my um, original entree into the civil rights movement, and that was her father, the Reverend Dr. Frederick Reese. He actually baptized me when I was nine years old as he served as pastor of the church that I grew up in in Selma. And shortly after that, he moved on to Ebenezer Baptist. In fact, they stole him uh, from us, but uh, we eventually forgave them for that. But <clears throat> Dr. Reese, for those of you who don't know about him, uh, he was a civil rights icon, um, a longtime educator, pastor of Ebenezer ba Missionary Baptist Church in Selma. And he was also best known for his role as the da Dallas County Voters League from 1964 to 1965, where he was instrumental in inviting Dr. King to come to Selma to fight for equal voting rights for African-Americans. Another point of departure here, uh, during that time, my mother would get up very early in the morning and she would sneak away. And we were always trying to figure out where is she going? What is she doing? Um, and I shared with uh, Dr. Ms. Harris this morning that we later learned that she was sneaking off to cook breakfast, help cook breakfast for Dr. King and the others involved in the strategizing that they were doing. But they had to be very secretive about it because it was a very dangerous time. And um, I noticed one day that she came back, she had a baseball cap. And I asked her, I said, where'd you get that baseball cap from? And she looked at me. It was actually uh, maybe months or a year or so later. She looked at me and she says, why do you want to know? I said, I noticed that you never wear it. It just kind of sits there. Well, as it turned out, Dr. King gave that hat to her, um, one of their 
chance meetings. And of course, Valerie was much younger. I asked if she remembered any of those things and she was much, much younger, so clearly not. But it was a very interesting time. Um, it was the courage and commitment of Dr. Reese that led to the Selma to Montgomery March and laid the foundation for the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Dr. Reese was an American hero, a national treasure, and the beloved Selma native son whose lifelong fight for voting rights forever shaped the fabric of US history. As a longtime educator, pastor, and civil rights activist, Dr. Reese's life and legacy stands as a testament to the power, as does Dr. King, what can happen when one man seeks to change the world. I know that many of the life-changing events that shaped my life because of the examples that Dr. Reese provided through his work as an educator and an activist helped to shape my thinking and my own activity as an activist. I'm especially proud to share. I'm especially proud to share that in 1965, the Selma foot soldiers answered the call and peacefully marched for voting rights for African Americans. They endured violence, many of them endured vicious beatings, but the persistence, passion, and strong beliefs led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act. On February 24th, 2016, why is it not advancing? There we go. Oops. On February 24th, 2016, the Congressional Medal was presented to the marches who took part in the Selma to Montgomery, Alabama protest. Speaker of the House Paul Ryan said, the foot soldiers' contributions to our country were so great, they deserve the highest honor in our possession, the Congressional Gold Medal. And I'm proud to share that I was one of those foot soldiers. Dr. Reese went to Washington to accept the Congressional Medal on behalf of the Selma foot soldiers. That's the picture of him on the day that he was presented with the medal. And that's the image of the medal that you see there on the screen. I remind you that the theme for today's commemoration of the life and legacy of Dr. King, that's another image there, uh, the late John Lewis, and of course, our Congresswoman Terry Sewell and others, uh, members of Congress at that time. I remind you that the theme for today's commemoration of the life and legacy of Dr. King is together we can be the dream and I take as a point of departure, cultivating a beloved community mindset to transform unjust systems. As you can see, I took the liberty to align with the King Center's theme this year, cultivating a beloved community mindset to transform unjust systems. Today, more than ever, there is a need for humanity to work towards creating a more just, humane, equitable, and peaceful world where the triple evils of racism, sexism, all isms, poverty and militarism cease to exist and love prevails. To create the world, we must first change our minds and, our, and ensure that our means aligns with our ends. Therefore, the charge is to start with ourselves, then connect with others. Cultivating a beloved community mindset transform the unjust systems. If we are to dismantle unjust systems, we need to educate ourselves and our children about how unjust systems work. And on April 3rd, 1957, in a speech titled Justice Without Violence, Dr. King noted, there are certain things we can say about this method that seeks justice without violence. It does not seek to defeat or humiliate the opponent, but to win their friendship and understanding. I think that this is one of the points, one of the basic points distinguishing between violence and nonviolence. The ultimate end of violence is to defeat the opponent. The ultimate end of nonviolence is to win the friendship of the opponent. It is necessary to boycott sometimes, but nonviolent resistors realize that boy, boycott is never an end within itself, but merely a means to awaken a sense of shame within the oppressor that the end is reconciliation, the end is redemption. 
And so the aftermath of violence is bitterness. The aftermath of nonviolence is the creation of the beloved community. The aftermath of nonviolence is redemption and reconciliation. This is a method that seeks to transform and to redeem and win the friendship of the opponent and make it possible for men and women to live together as brothers in a community and not con continually live with bitterness and friction. Justice without violence, again, that was a speech that he gave in April, 1957. Fast forward to today, and the voice of Lizzo. How many of you know who Lizzo is? Of course, <laughs> the voice of Lizzo, the singer songwriter offers a contemporary perspective as well on unjust systems. And she says, the fight still isn't people of color versus white, it's the people versus the system built to keep us down. That's the first line of the constitution and the system is made by man, but it is made of no man. Everyone, regardless of class, creed, culture, and ethnicity can fight the system and help to break it down. When Lizzo's reference to the first line of the Constitution, how many of you know what the first line of the Constitution says? You students. What's the first line of the Constitution? Yes, you got it. Smart people. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves, our prosperity, and our prosperity, to do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Mind you, it didn't say America, it says the United States of America. So I think that that's something that we need to be clear about. My interpretation of Dr. King and Lizzo's observations about um, what it means to be an American is that civil rights are human rights and how we interpret those often allow for different outcomes. So I wanna provide you with some context for a minute and using my own experience growing up in Selma as a part of that context. To provide you with context, you have to keep in mind that I am old enough to have lived through Jim Crow. How many other people in the room have lived through Jim Crow or lived through Jim Crow? Raise your hand. I know you're, I'm not the oldest person in this room. <laughs> Clearly, here's two, thank you. Um, as I reflect on my experiences coming of age in the segregated South, I am reminded of my family and others in my community who dared to live out large and loud during an era when Jim Crow was a defining feature that framed social and political interactions between black and white people. Segregated schools, segregated public bathrooms, segregated public transportation, everything was segregated. I remember during the holidays, and I talked about this yesterday, I'm in the Birmingham Leadership Birmingham class this year, and yesterday was our diversity day, and we spent the day at uh, well, it was three different locations. We went to the mosque, a Muslim mosque. Then we went to um, visit the Ability Center. The third location was the Bethel Baptist Church that the Reverend Dr. Fred Shuttlesworth led during his time here. And one of the things that came out of that was just how segregated Birmingham was during that time. Um, and it was no different all over the South. For me, the time span is not a distant memory that happened long ago. It is a historical period that inspired, and actually, if you count the years, it's still less than 60 years ago. A watershed moment is a point in time that provides significant space for clarity and is often related to historical change. In Selma, I was raised in a very close-knit community referred to as Summerfield. I came of age in Selma at the height of the 1960s civil rights movement. I was most privileged to have a front row seat to many of the events as they unfolded and eventually culminated in Bloody Sunday and the historic Selma to Montgomery March. Like many of the children, teenagers, and young adults who lived in my community at that time, I attended public, segregated public schools. In fact, we did round trip on a school bus 60 miles every day to and from school because the schools were that segregated. And interestingly enough, there was one predominantly white high school, but at least five separate high schools for black children across the county. 
And there were two separate school systems operating. There were Selma City Schools, and then there was Dallas County Schools. And they still operate today, except the difference is they are integrated um, and pretty much have defaulted to predominantly Black children attending both in both districts. I was most privileged to have a front row seat to many of those events. Like many of the children, teenagers, and young adults who lived in my community at that time, I attended segregated public schools. As students, we were eager to get involved in the mass meetings and marches because we could sense the winds of change blowing in Selma. The opportunity to exercise the right to vote was a lifelong dream held by many adults in my family and the community. During the 1960s, the civil rights movement was the most exciting expression of political activism in which my generation could en engage. As historian Joyce Wagner said, when she coined the term, the Emmett Till generation, there was no more exciting time to have been born than at that time. And the place and to the parents that movement, a young movement of people were home to. Uh, again, in, in uh, an effort to be completely transparent, uh, a lot of people sometimes when they ask me about my experiences growing up in Selma, they uh, sort of accept that it was pretty, pretty bad. But interestingly enough for me, um, we were a very insula insulated community. So a lot of the things that were happening outside in the city in particular, I really didn't have a whole lot of knowledge about until we integrated the all white high school in the city of Selma, which at that time was Albert G. Parish High School. It was really an uneventful experience for me because of who my family was. Um, we just didn't tolerate a lot of nonsense. And it was to the extent that my grandfather who was fortunate enough during his time to purchase 400 acres of property in Selma. And the legend is that when he went to make the last payment on that property, the person that he purchased it from cried because he assumed that he wouldn't be able to pay for it and he'd get it back. Um, and then there was another instance where um, during that time in the, I guess you call them stores, the little country stores that they have in those communities. One of my uncles, which was my grandfather's son, uh, my, my father's brother had a, a bill there. They would let people buy things on credit. And my uncle had bought some things on credit for his family, but apparently had not kept up with his bills. And so he walked into, my grandfather walked into the store one day and the store owner looked at him and said, boy, you need to tell your boy to come pay his bill. And my grandfather looked at him and said, who are you calling a boy? And the next thing they knew, he had picked the man up and stuffed him down a barrel of flour. And he went home and told my grandmother to take the kids and go in the basement, a cellar, whatever that was at the time. And he sat on the porch all night with his gun waiting for the Ku Klux Klan to show up, but they never came. Well, when my grandfather eventually did pass away from natural causes, the rumor was that that same man made the comment when he heard that he had died, well, he should have been dead. But, you know, of course, um, that was one of the things that Interestingly enough, how these narratives play out, but that's one of the stories that gets told over and over at our family reunions, and it sort of resonates with me because some people, I think, sometimes want to know, well, where'd you get that spirit from? And I assume that may be a part of it. My grandmother was just as fiery about a lot of these things, but um, that was my experience. And one of the things that I like to think about when I went to the all-white high school I didn't really go there with a lot of expectations that things would be different. I just knew that the school that I attended that was predominantly black lacked a lot of resources. In fact, we had a outdoor basketball court that wasn't paved. So the guys played basketball on ground, like, you know, just real, real dirt. Um, <clears throat> we didn't have a science lab. We had a really tiny library. And so when I did enter the doors of Parish High School, it was a moment of awe because there were so many things there that made me realize, you know, this is what privilege looks like. This is what it looks like when people make decisions about um, who will have access to resources. So um, fast forward um, to my senior year, there was a moment there where all of the 
there were, there were three African-American girls in the senior class. The class of 1970 was the last, um, the class of 69, I'm sorry, was the last predominantly white class to graduate from Parish High School. And their motto was exactly that, the last white class of Albert G. Parish High School. So fast forward, in my junior year, uh, there was an expectation that all of the girls in the class would compete for Miss Albert G. Parish High School. And when the list came out and it was time to vote, my name and the names of the other three African-American women who were in that class were left off the list. But of course, you know, we weren't shaken by that because we knew that all the spaces where they had to go take pictures, all these other things that would happen, we would not have been welcome in those spaces anyway. So it was, you know, needless to say that we ended up going to the junior prom at the predominantly black school in Selma because the way the prom situation was set up, that really wasn't, wasn't that we were fearful or afraid that something would happen. It just was not a welcoming space. And they did everything that they could to let remind us that we didn't belong there. And so that was pretty much my experience. And I remember my senior year when I went to the guidance counselor's office to talk to him about my, my college aspirations, he actually looked at me and said, why are you here? And I said, what do you mean, why am I here? We, we were supposed to schedule appointments to talk to you. He says, well, really, you should just think about going to the community college and getting a vocational degree. Like, don't you wanna be a hairdresser or whatever? <laughs> so I went home that evening and I shared with my mother what he had said to me. And my mom just looked at me and she said, and what did you say? I said, nothing, I just got up and left. She said, good, you don't need to say anything. She said, in fact, don't go back in there. Um, but when I finished my PhD at Emory, because he lived out in the community, I stopped by his house and I gave him a copy of it. And I said, this is what, this is what happens when you decide that you're gonna determine your own fate. You know, he hardly remembered me by then, but of course, you know, I had to remind him of that exchange. And so it was very interesting to say the least. Uh, the facets of a beloved community mindset and why the facets are critical to us. Uh, Dr. King helped to, to us to understand that if you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change the way you think about it. And that's what a, a mindset is as far as how you think about things that need to be changed. The historical biases. The historical biases behind the mindset that accepts and or perpetuates injustice, what we must unlearn and relearn on the path to beloved community about uh, injustice, the facets of a beloved community mindset and why the facets are critical to us as Dr. King said, Make of, this, make of this old world a new world and how a transformed way of thinking leads to transformed systems without attention to specific systems. We live in a world with unjust systems and structures, the traditional legal means that attorneys often litigate to address systemic issues or individual cases to remedy such injustices. And by the way, when I entered the predominantly white high school in Selma, Brown had already passed in 1954. The schools in Alabama and elsewhere in the South did not fully integrate until the 1960s, as did most of our higher education institutions. I think Tuscaloosa, it was 1963, 64. Auburn was around 1964, all of those. And they did everything they could to resist that integration. The story of Auburn was that when uh, Mr. Franklin, his name was Harold Franklin, when he applied, graduated from Alabama State University, and when he applied to Auburn, um, the um, system in place at that time, which would be our legislation, legislators, decredited the, the, the institution and then denied his admission, saying that he had not graduated from an accredited university. 
Well, thanks to uh, attorney Fred Gray and the brilliance of uh, Mr. Gray and UW Clement, they actually filed a lawsuit on Mr. Franklin's behalf that was heard by Judge Frank Johnson. And I encourage you to go read those documents sometimes if you can, because they're very interesting in terms of how uh, Frank Johnson decided um, that it was time for the state of Alabama to get on board, particularly with the higher education institutions. But I remember an interview that he did uh, when the person who was interviewing him asked him, uh, what made this such an important issue for you? And he talked about his mother and how his mother had sort of planted the seed, you know, that people are people and we basically want the same things when it comes to our humanity. And he thought long and hard about that. But um, Mr. Franklin ended up not graduating from Auburn, although back in, 19, in 2014, they actually did recognize him. So now there is a historic marker, a historic marker on the campus that acknowledges um, his walk on July, January 4th of 1964 when he was inter when he was allowed to register and enroll at um, Auburn. And that's kind of a narrative, not just uh, in Alabama, but in other um, Southern states, most of the Southern state universities have all in some form had some kind of commemoration where they've had to acknowledge that past in terms of the structures of the unjust systems that were in place that deny people's humanity or the opportunity. And I would argue and maintain that while education is the great equalizer, it's even more important for people to have access to opportunity. And when you deny people access to opportunity, therein lies the dilemma in terms of how unjust systems can work to marginalize and keep people from reaching their highest potential. We live in a world with unjust systems and structures. The traditional legal means, sometimes litigated by attorneys to address systemic issues or individual cases to remedy injustices are inadequate by themselves to create just systems and structures. For example, 50 years after Congress passed the Fair Housing Act to put an end to inequities in our housing system and eliminate racial segregation in American neighborhoods and guarantee that all people in the US have the right to obtain the housing of their choice free from discrimination resulting from state sanctioned policies such as inequities and racial segregation remain Despite the fact that some progress toward residential desegregation has been made between 1970 and 2010, using one measure, some metropolitan areas ceased being hypersegregated, but others became hypersegregated, with 21 cities remaining in hypersegregated since 2010. Environmental justice is another area where the, the unjust systems are at play. Uh, the Environmental Justice Enforcement of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency is a second example that shows the failures of attorney-led advocacy to address historic inequity. When racial discrimination and socio-political explanation best explain present-day inequities or hazardous polluting facilities more to communities of color, the law may naturally be looked at to provide a remedy. Yet the EPA, the, that the lead agency in the environmental sector has failed to enforce the law. Legal systems also fail to provide redress for communities facing police misconduct and other civil rights violations, claims for damages for con constitutional violations by police and other government actors are increasingly unwinnable as a result of the Supreme Court's actors the Supreme Court's expansion of the qualified immunity defense. Administrative complaints filed with the federal agencies such as the US Department of Justice are often effective in if the presidential administration with authority over these administrative agencies will investigate them. Consent decrees, court orders, directing a police department to make policy training or other changes without an admission of guilt or liability are also subject to the political will of the presidential administration who must enter into and enforce them. Advocates for Basic Legal Equality Inc. in Dayton, Ohio has endeavored to use all of these traditional legal tools 
often with mixed results. One of the authors poured hundreds of hours into litigating two racial profiling cases against state police only to lose on qualified immunity and other grounds. None of these legal avenues center the perspective and leadership of impacted communities. And none of these avenues attempt to change a system that disproportionately victimizes Black, Latino, and Native American people. Another example is in the immigration context. Traditional legal remedies such as applications for visas or deportation defense litigation fail to address a fundamentally unjust immigration system. Antiquated immigration laws in, this, in desperate need of reform render many individuals, including those with significant family and community ties to the US ineligible for lawful immigration status. Many immigrants who are eligible for a visa or a lawful permanent residence are stuck in lengthy administrative processing or visa backlogs that can last for decades or even a century. As a result, many immigrants, particularly those without law, lawful immigrant status who are longstanding members of local communities remain trapped in a cycle of poverty, forced to work in low wage jobs with little access to public benefits or affordable health care. Yet Congress remains unable to pass legislation to reform this unjust system. The last broad sweeping immigration reform legislation was passed in 1986. With no real chance of a solution by the federal government, some immigrant communities and their allies have launched organizing campaigns to regain local power. In the environmental context, the existing legal remedies have also proven inadequate to address the health and safety harms faced by low-income communities. Existing legal frameworks fail to adequately address nearly all social justice issues. The COVID-19 pandemic has further highlighted inequality and the limits of the legal system in remedying such growing inequality with social determinants of health, such as housing, occupation, education, income, wealth gaps, and other factors associated with more COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations and deaths in areas where racial and ethnic minority groups live, learn, work, play, and worship. These realities should cause social justice attorneys and activists to rethink their approach to achieving lasting social change. These case examples show how attorneys can use community lawyering, lawyering to strategies to support client identified and client directed advocacy, advocacy to build power in systems, policing and environmental justice that historically fail to engage the communities they impact. And I would offer that many of the hard won gains for social justice, equity and inclusion are under threat. The changing social climates and divided political landscapes reveal the character of a nation that continues to grapple with profound division, conflicts between groups that exist in our history and in the present. Scholars who study social change and social movements agree that such events usually evolve from strained relationships between those who have power and those who do not. To, to some extent, these movements arise when people, when groups in society feel discontented about some element or perceived injustice in their lives. Yes, it would be an extraordinary thing if all people of goodwill realize that they do not have to wait to be invited to get involved and work for positive social change. The, the change in political climates and divided social landscapes insists that we work together to address the crisis of our democratic enterprise. That perspective has been helpful to me. I find a lot of comfort in that, as well as a lot of challenges and opportunities to make a difference. Sometimes we must find the courage to stand up. Some, quite often when I do talks, I would say a lot to people, right now what I need, people ask me, well, what do you need, how can we help? I just need a few good people with courage. I hope and expect that you will have the courage to stand up for truth and integrity and against dishonesty and corruption for knowledge and evidence and against it, stand up for knowledge and evidence and against ignorance and lies. For people who are being left behind or left out and against concentrations of power and fortune for the benefit of self-serving elites. For the rule of law and a free press and a strong civil society and effective governance and against attacks for those institutions. For freedom and against oppression, for excellence against prejudice and injustice. 
but courage is not just about standing up for what we believe. Sometimes courage is about sitting down and listening to what we may not initially believe. David Hampton, the Dean of the Harvard Divinity, Divinity School, once told his folk that deans need to have a generosity of spirit. He did not define what he meant by generosity of spirit, but it was really like a good sermon. His comment required reflection. As I reflect on the idea of generosity of spirit, for me, it means that we should try harder to see issues through the eyes of others and to act in ways that reflect an understanding of their perspectives, which can translate to speaking bravely and listening generously. Generous listening can take, us, take as much courage as brave speaking because listening to people with whom you strongly disagree or with whom you think you have nothing in common is hard. It is really hard work. My son and I are probably two of the best examples of doing that hard work. He is as far different from, I told him last night, I think they gave me the wrong child. I really do. But understanding others' perspectives and acting on that understanding is crucial for making a better world. To be clear, listening and understanding do not always mean agreeing and compromising. When we look back on the past public policies and leaders, we should not look equally fondly on the different sides of every issue on which we had always just split the difference between one side or another. On the contrary, we need to make moral judgments. In a recent lecture, Samantha Power, how many of you know who Samantha Power is? Good for you, who, tell them who she is. Yes, and she's also right now serving in the Biden administration as the administrator of USAID, the US Agency for International Development. And one of the talks that she gave, she actually praised the brave acts of those who back in the 60s during the civil rights movement resisted injustice over the course of US history, saying that their acts are bright spots that shine light in the darkness. And she continued to suggest that you follow your moral principles and create bright spots. But I also urge you to recognize that your assessment of light and dark at any point in time may not be completely right. It is too easy for each of us to view ourselves as being on the side of the angels or goodness. The theologian Reinhold Niebuhr saying, it's always wise to seek the truth in our opponents error and the error in our own truth. As you have courage to stand up for what you think is right, have the courage to also search for error in your own truth. Frederick Doug Douglass, and I quote, this should be familiar to you, once said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue till they are resisted with either words or blows or both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those who they must and will oppress. So for me, some final thoughts for you. Educate yourself about structural injustice. Get past your own fear of discussing structural racism. Look for organizations and agencies that support your efforts or that provide an interest for you to address structural injustice and get involved and engaged. Heighten awareness of the historical and contemporary contradictions in US life. And our history shows us that there have been many contradictions over the years. And finally, help our children learn to become agents of change because we each generation is charged with passing that on. And we really need to make sure that our children are aware of this history and that they understand how structural injustice works. The continuing work of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion will require all of us to participate. I challenge each of you to think about how you can become a part of the movement to transform UAB, our communities, and our state into, more, into a more inclusive space and locations for belonging and thriving. All of us can't do everything, but all of us can do something. What is your eye in the word community. Thank you.
And I'd like to start if that's okay. First of all, thank you so much, Dr. Dilworth. And sure. I especially enjoyed hearing some of your personal reflections about your experience and really appreciate you being willing to share that with sure. us today. So as you were talking, I was really touched by uh, the way you brought the theme uh, around to the idea of developing a beloved community. Um, and I was thinking actually about the meeting that I was in this morning with our diversity and inclusion team at the School of Medicine. Mm -hmm. And we discussed in there um, uh, several new plans in 2023 to help us create what I'd like to say is a beloved community in the School of Medicine for especially our students and our faculty and our staff there. And as we were going through those, um, Dr. Young, who was in the meeting, said, you know, these are some really ambitious goals that we've set forth for us. And do we have the bandwidth to do this? And that's something that seems that just keeps coming up for us in our school is there's so much that we want to do. There's so much that work that needs to be done. And there's always the question of, we, I think we do have a few courageous people yeah. uh, on our team, but there's so much more that's needed. So I, if you don't mind just commenting on that. and Sure. Giving us so, your thoughts. you know, one of the questions that I get asked quite a bit in this role is, how do you do your job? I mean, it's a constant. And when I ask the person to elaborate even more, what do you mean? Why do you ask that question? I do my job the same way you do yours. Um, and to the extent that it means that um, you have to have um, a clear vision about where you're trying to go. And sometimes that means that um, there are things that you can do immediately, and there are things that are going to be long range. But I think the part that I said in the very end is you, everybody can't do everything all at once, but you can make some decisions about prioritizing what really, I think of it this way. And so as I look around the institution, I always try to think about where are the spaces where people are suffering the most? And where's the greatest need for intervention in terms of or intervention or innovation in terms of what it is that we do. And those are the areas and some of those like the School of Medicine, some of our other schools have pretty much taken leadership to engage around those areas. Mona and I've had many long conversations about some of the issues that come up around, you know, well-being and belonging and things of that nature and how do, how do we resolve some of those issues. But I think that that's the first thing is you have to think about what's really doable in the immediate er area and where are people really suffering the most? Where, where is the, where, what are our pain points and how can we address those pain points? There's a hand over here, here. Hello, everyone. I am Destiny Shepherd. I am a senior at Miles College. I am also the president of the Miles College Choir. Go to voices. Sorry, guys. Um, so my question to you would be, um, you shared your experiences, plans, and goals for things to help us to move forward as um, one, to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. uh, for as my generation, what would you... Um, what type of advice would you give us to stay positive for as moving forward and to help our community and generation to become better? That's a great question because um, when I think about my own experience when I was where, where I guess I should say with the mic. When I think about my own experience where I was at about your age, by then I had graduated from high school and I moved on to an HBCU, went to Florida a and yay. But the idea was that that activist spirit never left me. Um, there were some things happening at FAMU at the time that required activism and we got involved. And I think that's the passion. Find what is what are you passionate about? And whatever that passion is, embrace it 
and think about ways in which, especially if it's something that needs to be changed, it's unjust, then work within the means that you have to start to address those. First, educate yourself about what, what are the issues here? What needs to be addressed? Is there something that needs to be fixed or removed? That kind of thing. And don't think that you can go it alone. I had a mentor tell me that once, that Paulette, as uh, committed and passionate as you are about a particular issue, you can't go it alone. So you have to find some like-minded people to surround yourself with who have the commitment and the passion to do that. And that's a great question too, because I have been working with some groups sometimes who come, like they wanna do some very interesting things like write these lofty statements about racism, white supremacy, all these other things. And I tell them, I said, so after you write the statement, where, where's the action that's gonna back it up? What are you gonna do? So that's the idea is once you identify something that you're passionate about and you want to do something about it, come up with an action plan that you think, and it may not work the first time, but don't give up. I can't tell you how many times we marched to the courthouse in Selma only to be turned back, only to be arrested, only to be told, if you don't go away, we are gonna arrest you. I have a funny story to share too about that because this talks about resistance and nonviolence. One day we had gone to the courthouse and Jim Clark, who was the sheriff in Selma, um, had his little bullhorn. He says, you guys need to disperse. And so somebody said, I'm not going to jail today. I don't care what he says. I mean, you know, it was that moment. So guess what we did when they said, you're all under arrest, we took off running and we scattered all over the city. Didn't catch a single one of us. But the point was like, you know, you have to take control of the situation sometimes. And so being a young adult looking to be a change agent in your community or wherever you find yourself, find that issue that is important to you and, and work on it. And I also would offer, how many of you registered to vote? All of you, I hope. Raise your hand, everybody. I need to see everybody's hand. Because if you're not, you need to go register to vote. That's really important. If you didn't get that message from what I shared, then I don't know, it's lost because the decisions that are being made are being made by people who don't see you. They don't even know you exist. So my point is, and once you vote, be vigilant about holding the people accountable that you put in office and make sure that they are standing on the promises that they made to you to help you decide that you were going to vote for them. That's one of the things that's a very important thing. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Other questions? Just to follow up on the voting, um, could you explain to the young people and the old people in the audience why we keep voting even though our candidates don't win, why it's important to keep voting? Say that again, I can hardly hear you. Um, could you explain to the young people in the audience and the old people in the audience why it is important to keep voting even though our candidates do not win? I mean, I think it's hard for, for, for us to keep enthusiasm about voting, especially in, uh, you know, for well, it's, 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 I think, I think there's a different component of your question. We keep voting, but then we go home and we close our blinds and we expect for them to do what they promised to do. And our activism doesn't kick in. So you keep voting, but you also have to let your activism do some work too. I write letters, I make phone calls. And I actually, whenever some of them are showing up in places, I'm there and I'll say, hey, can we have a conversation? Because here's what I need to talk to you about uh, to understand, what are you gonna do about this particular issue? So you keep voting, but you also have to continue to be that activist. And that is a form of activism, holding your elected officials accountable and making sure that they do, they stand on the promise that help them get elected and not just assuming that they are gonna do what they said. I had a conversation yesterday with somebody which was kind of interesting um, because one of the things that came out in one of our government day experiences, some of the lobbyists who work on behalf of uh, organizations and politicians, how many of you know how lobbyists work and what they do? Uh, because that also is an area where I don't think that people realize how even though people get elected, the things that they promise to do 
may become less of a priority than what they're being paid to advocate for on behalf of an organization or a group or whatever it is. So that's another reason why as citizens, you have power, you should not abdicate that power by voting and then going home and shuttering your blinds. Here's a First of all, let me thank you for your presentation today. Excellent job. Uh, I'm glad I came today to hear this. One of, one of the things I find that when I'm uh, addressing and talking to young people today is the fact that they are discouraged about the hypocrisy that they see in the institutions and the systems. And that's discouraging for many that cause them not to want to be involved because they say, what's the use? Nobody's for real. They call it, they're not real uh, today. So what would you say to young people who find themselves discouraged because of the hypocrisy that they see in all, many of our institutions today? And the second part is, how do we address what I call materialistic individualism that, that prevails in our community today? What would you say to those young people who are caught up into that as well? Stop spending your money and invest it and, <laughs> and, and build and build uh, build a pathway. This is one of the conversations that I've had with my own children. You know, stop spending your money. Stop buying things just to impress other people. But let me start with the first thing that you asked the hypocrisy. Um, I think government has always been hypocritical. And that's not going to change. But what does change is the people that we manage to elect who really do want to do the right thing. But you have to be, so, you know, this whole campaign about Stop Woke, that came out of the youth movement with our um, hip hop community, Stay Woke. And essentially that's what it is. Part of the reason that our politicians don't want people to stay woke is they get to do what they want to do and everybody else I can't use the word I want, but everybody else, you just have to suffer the consequences, right? So ultimately it is educate yourself about the things that they're being hypocritical about and then call them, don't call them out, call them in and say, I mean, so as an example, um, when I was an undergraduate at Florida a and there was a lot of discussion in Tallahassee at that time about merging Florida a and University with Florida State University. And of course, the alumni in particular were like, that's not going to happen. We eventually decided, well, it's time for us to take matters in our own hands because they, because they were actually moving very, very slow. So the students decided to march to the Capitol. We actually took over the, the, the governor's mansion, slept on the lawn, slept in the, and, and did all of that. And we were there for five days because that was the, the thing, but it got their attention to let them know that, I mean, you know, there was a, all this thing of, during the time that they were running, that's not gonna happen. And of course, as soon as they, they did get elected, they started talking about what they were gonna do to our beloved university. And that was one of the things. So you have to be vigilant, but aware of what's happening around you. And when you say that they're being hypocritical, what is the hypocrisy all about? Understand that. But the other part of that, in terms of our own economic uh, security, you need to think about ways in which you can stop working for the money and let the money work for you. And that's a very critical piece to understand. Hey, how you doing? Um, my name is Tristan Dinwiddie. I'm the Can you speak head... into the microphone? Oh, how you doing? My name is Tristan Dinwiddie. I'm the head section leader for the Booming Bases and Baritone. Um, I also have a two-part question like the Beatty. <laughs> so I was looking at the slides and stuff from earlier, and I think number five was talking about his quote. I don't remember it verbatim, but it was talking about a form of pivotal thinking. Um, and for my generation, being discouraged is kind of like a day-to-day -day thing. You know, we we get bogged down by like little by little things that uh that y'all do on a daily basis. So could you help us on like figure out a form of pivotal thinking for us that'll help us better? 
Are you saying pivotal thinking? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah. So, and are you saying that in reference to just being able to manage your life? No, 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 not, not necessarily day-to-day -day management, but you were, you were referring to things like being an activist and, and not wasting our money and investing it and, and actually taking part in a community like, like this uh, lady asked earlier. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know, like, like, how would you go about like the mental process of doing it? Because it's, it's it's easier said than done, but you got to feel yeah. motivated to get up. Yeah. Are you a member of, of an organization? At, this organization is this, this in the in the band. Yeah. That's it. Lifting those beautiful voices. What are some of the other things you're doing in your community? Well, I, I'm me personally. Uh, I feel like uh, the way we sing as the Miles College Golden Voices, we uh, it's a form of ministry. Mm -hmm. So. You do one thing, but it has multiple outcomes. Right. So each of you, I'm sure, has other talents besides those beautiful voices, right? And what are some of those talents that you could tap into to begin to use that as leverage uh, to identify an issue, for example, that you might be interested in? So for me, one of the things that I, I have grandchildren now, and one of my granddaughters is 11, and... For whatever reasons, I, we can't motivate her right now to be involved in anything extracurricular. She makes really good grades, but she doesn't want to dance. She doesn't want to sing. She doesn't want to be in band. But to me, what I've been able to do is connect her to young people like you, where they, her, she sees the significance and the importance. So maybe that might be a place for you to start. Like each generation reach the next generation to help them connect to some of the things that, you know, they might be able to build upon. It's not always working to change the system. It's working to change how we respond to the system so that as we're able to navigate that system, you know, we can help other people learn that as well. And I really am serious about this next generation of young people and making sure that they get what they need to navigate this because it be it's becoming not only more hypocritical, but more and more hostile. And it, it does require a level of savvy to do that. But that's a conversation really, uh, I think, be happy to spend more time with you talking about some of the things that could be done. Okay, and, and one more thing, could you talk about uh, the investment part? Because we would love to do that. We would love to expand the money, but it seems like doing it is the same as just like digging yeah. for gold and not knowing where you're going. So I can't, I'm not sure. So I'm not sure if I can share all of this because that, that would really be making myself vulnerable. But when I went to graduate school, I had a, I went down to, Emory gave me a full fellowship, right? But I was working full time. And so to show you how advocacy works for yourself, my uh, advisor essentially said, well, you know, you need to quit your job, right? In order to maintain your fellowship. And my next question to her was, show me the policy that says I have to do that. There was no policy. So I got my fellowship. I invested it. And guess what I did with it? Paid my kids tuition. The principal was still there. So when they graduated, they didn't have student loans or money to pay back. But the idea is you think about, you know, ways in which you can do those things to leverage the resources that you have uh, my parents never talked to, to us about going to college. And it was only when I got to college that I recognized how poor we were because we had other resources, but not necessarily financial resources. But at the same time, my brother went to Alabama. My sister came to Florida and m with me. And we both took care of each other. The three of us took care of each other that way. So it was that, that you have to recognize that something is much more important than wearing the latest handbag or uh, having a car that has all the bells and whistles and all these other things. Those things come and go, and guess what? They depreciate. They have no value. But how can you make your money work so that there is value added to what you're trying to accomplish? Okay. Thank you. Can I address that issue about investment? Sure. Let me, I, don't think I think Dr. A.G. Gasson had a formula for that. He said, a part of all you earn is yours to keep. And if you remember that, if you remember that, 
You're not giving it. Don't give everybody all that you have. Some of you ought to keep for yourself and make work for you. Uh, don't spend everything you, I tell my grandkids, mm -hmm. don't spend everything you get your hands on. A part of all you earn, remember that, is mm -hmm. yours to keep and make it work. There's one more, she, she's been, one more question and then we'll go we'll down. Sorry. I just have a comment to the student. Um, you know, one thing that we learn in school, um, we uh, choose a major. One thing we don't learn is about money, how to invest, how to make money. And, you know, to make a, a comment, what this gentleman said, always pay yourself first mm -hmm. before you pay anybody else. So uh, you're, I think your question is more about accumulation of wealth and how you stabilize yourself uh, is what I'm hearing. So that's what you need to learn. We learn a lot about things in education but we don't learn about money. So I would suggest uh, educating yourself on how to make money, how to invest. That's so important, especially in our community. Yeah. Well, thank you all for your questions. And I am serious. If you'd like to spend more time having conversations about, I'm happy to pay a visit to you to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, really, really appreciate the the depth and the richness of your talk today, Dr. Dilworth. It would, would take us really, really much more time to to dwell in all the things that he said and and your experience and uh, also your recommendations and suggestions. We really appreciate that, and we appreciate everybody uh, that came in, the ones on the virtual. Um, I want to thank Erica Brown, uh, Alicia Hartbrand, Jessica Reinhardt, and, and Mary Hillier that they organized all this. And, and again, thank you so much. I think there are a lot, even if you can just remember four or five things from what Dr. Dilworth said today is going to be really, really important to you. And I just remember to be a bright spot. Being a bright spot can win a lot of hearts and win all those people that resist you. So try that. I think that's that's a, that's one of the things. So we want to thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day and have a nice weekend, actually a longer weekend. Thank you.